We're in John 21. John 21. The last chapter of John. And one of the greatest stories. One that only John tells us. We looked at it last week in its uh, introductory phases. We want to get into the heart of it today. But let's pray as we begin. Jesus, I believe that we do matter to you. And I believe that in this story, you showed that we matter to you even when we mess up royally. That we still matter. You still have a place for us. That your forgiveness is complete and full. And your restoration is as full as the resurrection. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So when Jesus rose from the dead, we've already noted that there are several passages a couple of them in Scripture that describe what happened. Luke, Luke, in the book of Acts, chapter 1, tells us he appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, lists that he appeared to Peter, he appeared to the 12. That seems to be on Resurrection Day, as listed in the Gospel of John. Then later on, he appeared to over 500 at one time, most of whom were still alive at the time that Paul was writing 1 Corinthians. And then that he appeared to James. We don't have any record of that appearance beyond what Paul says. And then to the apostles again. And that's probably when Luke tells us about Jesus leading them out to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus ascended to heaven as they watched. John tells us, of course, that he appeared three times to the disciples. First in the upper room on the night of the resurrection. When he appeared, boom, it's me. I'm real. Touch me. I'm not a ghost. I'm a real person. Jesus is real. The resurrection is real. Resurrected people are going to be like Jesus was, real. You, they could feel him. He ate. We're, we're going to eat together in the kingdom. It's, it's a real place with real people. And then a week later, Jesus appeared again for Thomas. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe till I can touch it. And Jesus says, come on, put your hand here. It's me. Blessed are those who having not seen, still believe. And that's us. We don't see in person. We have to look at the evidence. And then this third time, John says, Jesus appeared. So we'll start in John chapter 21 again, verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the, to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee. And in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin or Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and two other unnamed disciples were together. And Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Now remember, Peter had a boat, right? So why not? If you've got a boat and you've got the tackle, you've got the net, there's nothing to do. Jesus is kind of, now you see him, now you don't during these 40 days, you know. They never know when he's going to show up or where or how. He did say on a certain mountain, and he kept that appointment evidently, but they're just kind of hanging out. You know, the resurrection is over. Jesus is alive. They believe that. But what are we supposed to do with this? There's kind of this incognito time here. Peter says, I got a boat. Let's go fishing. So probably where they went fishing was where Peter's boat was, right? Uh, just right out there, you know, Peter had a home in Capernaum. His wife, his mother-in-law lived there. Jesus healed the mother-in-law. We know that about Peter. We know later on when Peter traveled around preaching, uh, he took his believing wife with him, Paul says. Uh, so he was married. He was a family man. I haven't got a clue how he fed his family while he followed Jesus for three years, but you know what? Jesus takes care of those things. You follow him, he'll take care of you. But now... Peter doesn't have anything to do. Besides, he royally screwed up on the night Jesus was uh, arrested and tried, claimed long and loud for all to hear, including John and Jesus, that he'd never heard of this man. Peter had turned out to be a big bag of wind. I remember the first time I ran into a bag of wind. We were looking for kitchen linoleum in Utica, New York, and I was in second or third grade. And we went down to this store. And this man, 
as an eight or nine year old, he had me convinced that he had the greatest product on planet Earth. I mean, he was really good. And it's the first time I'd run into a good salesman that I remembered. And uh, when we got out of there, my mother said, boy, he was a bag of wind. <laughs> And it was kind of my first lesson to think about, be careful you don't get carried away by somebody's exuberance or salesmanship. Uh, they may just be a bag of wind. And uh, Peter was a big bag of wind. He's the one who said, you are the Messiah. He's the one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then he's the one that three times loudly said, never heard of the guy, having had a thing to do with him. And he, the third time, emphasized it with profanity. He was a fisherman, cursing and swearing. And Jesus heard that one. And John says Jesus turned and locked eyes with Peter. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. He knew he was a washout. And yet, on the day of the resurrection, the angels had said to the women, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here, he is risen. Go tell the disciples and Peter to meet him at the prearranged mountain appointment in Galilee. I don't know if he, Peter would have even bothered to show up for that appointment. Except later that same day also when the two from Emmaus arrived back from their seven-mile walk down with Jesus incognito, and then after he showed himself and disappeared, they walked back to Jerusalem. When they arrived, everyone says, he has risen, and he showed himself to Peter. So it's interesting, on Resurrection Day, Jesus had the angels mention Peter. Jesus had a little personal appearance to Peter because Peter was broken in pieces. He'd crashed and burned in his own eyes in the eyes of the disciples the other disciples he had no credibility and yet Jesus keeps saying Peter I want to meet with you and yet I believe that Peter was still well do you have trouble forgiving yourself sometimes especially when you hurt somebody you really love you know often everybody else forgives us and we're still beating ourselves up and I think Peter was in that beating himself up mode. He just couldn't get past what he had done. And he couldn't hardly believe that Jesus could get past what he had done to him. And he was certain, I think, the other disciples would not get past what he had done. But he's still hanging out with them, and he says, let's go fishing. So they said, we're going too. And it says they went out, and they fished all night. And caught nothing. So they had a night of frustration. If you get your fishing gear out and you go fishing and you don't catch anything, I guess you had a nice day at the lake, right? But still, you don't have dinner, right? And when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not, did not know it was Jesus, because we're told later on they were about 200 cubits or 100 yards offshore. So they're a football field away from the shore, and there's a man on the shore in the early morning mist by the lake. And John tells us it was Jesus, but they didn't know it. So the man on the shore, verse 5, calls out, Children, did you catch anything? Literally, do you have any food or did you get anything to eat? It doesn't actually use the word fish. So somebody 100 yards away goes, children, that's a strange thing to call a group of seven fishermen in a boat. If you walk up by a lake and somebody's standing there fishing that you've never met before, you don't say, beloved, have you caught anything? <laughs> Probably wouldn't use any endearing terms, would you? But the, this person goes, children, it's kind of an endearing term, my little ones. Have you got anything to eat? Does the guy want fish? And they yell back, no. And he said, we'll cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. 
It's like walking up to the fisherman at the fishing hole who's been there all day and hasn't caught a thing and say, well, why don't you, why don't you put your hook over there? They're going to probably tell you exactly where to go, right? But they complied. It says they threw their net on the right side of the boat. And they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. You understand, they always fished at night. The water is very clear. Otherwise, the fish were scared away by every movement. So they fished in the dark. They fished all night, found nothing. And now when it's morning and the fish can see everything and there's no chance of them catching anything, somebody says, try the other side of the boat. And they have a boatload of fish. And deja vu sets in. We've been here before. Luke chapter 5. Keep your place in John 21. But you remember the story. Jesus is out by the Sea of Galilee and he needs a pulpit. And he sees two boats, verse 2, and some fishermen who are washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, the very boat these guys are fishing in now. Three years before, Jesus had climbed into Simon's boat and said, could you put out just a little bit from land? You know, it's nice if you're talking to a crowd if you can kind of get back and up just a little bit. And then Jesus sat down. I could never preach sitting down. But that was what they did last then. He sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep. Let down your nets for a catch. Any fisherman would say it's the wrong time of day. There's not a chance we'll catch a thing. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Now remember, Peter had met Jesus a few weeks or months before this down by the Jordan near John the Baptist there just uh, at, right, after the, uh, right after the temptations, 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus comes back. John the Baptist points out the Lamb of God. John follows and, and uh, Andrew, and Andrew goes, finds his brother Peter and says, come and see Jesus. So they'd already met. They'd hung out together. They'd been at the wedding feast at Cana together. Um, but there hadn't been a formalized calling yet. They were not like full-timers. And now here by the sea, Peter has been with Jesus. He's seen the uh, wedding feast water turned into wine. He knows there's something special about this man. This isn't completely new. Jesus wasn't an unknown person walking by the sea saying, oh, follow me, and they walked off and followed him. There was some context. But no matter how much you start hanging around with Jesus, there comes a point where the call comes, are you willing to give it all? Let down your net. Okay, Lord, didn't catch anything at night, but at your word we'll let it down. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish that their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners, and that was James and John. Okay, so that's where you get Andrew and Peter, James and John. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Now this is a fisherman's bonanza, right? These guys are temporarily rich. They could probably sell all this fish and get that new car or boat or whatever they need, okay? This is harvest time when they bring it all in and suddenly you've got cash. Simon Peter saw it and he fell at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Peter always let his words hang out, right? He felt unworthy, he said it. This is too much. And they were all astonished at the catch as were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. They walked away from the biggest catch they'd ever had and followed Jesus. Now, Jesus is just always playing dirty tricks. Have you noticed that? Right when you think you've hit the bonanza, he says, oh, let's go over here. They're in Capernaum. They heal all the people on a Saturday night. And the people are clamoring after Jesus. The next morning, Peter finds Jesus. Hey, everybody's looking for you. Jesus says, great, let's go somewhere else. 
Huh? Jesus is hanging out in Galilee and his brothers are saying, if you want to be famous, you need to go to Jerusalem. Yeah, that's your time. My time's not here yet. Jesus just doesn't function like we think. Maybe that's a complete sentence. Jesus doesn't function like we think, right? His thoughts are not our thoughts. And he says to them, leave it all and let's go catch some people. And they left it all. And all that multitude had free fish that day. I'm sure that entire multitude descended on those boats and they were empty of fish in no time flat. Unless Zebedee managed to hold them all off and that's what they used to pay Peter's bills the next three years. I don't know. The point is, they're now at the lake three years later. Peter, having followed Jesus, having bombastically said he would follow him to death, has completely washed up. Jesus has risen and given him a little hope. Tell Peter I want to meet with him. He appears to Peter. And now Jesus sets up a deja vu. The same boat, the same sea, the same shoreline. And he says, you caught anything to eat? No, we'll throw your net on the other side. And all of a sudden they have another boatload of fish. And Peter... He's a little slow. John's faster. John says to Peter, verse 7, it's the Lord. <laughs> That's got to be Jesus. He showed up again. When Peter that, heard that, he wrapped his outer garment around him and literally the, the scripture says threw himself into the sea. He wasn't going to wait for the boat to get to shore. He had to get there. As I mentioned last week, I don't understand why he wrapped himself in his outer cloak to do that. Generally, you'd throw that off to go swimming. But yet he didn't feel like he could go up to Jesus just in his skivvies, so to speak. It says he'd taken all his outer clothing off to, to fish. He had probably a loincloth or a little tunic on. He felt like he had to fix things up a little bit. And isn't that funny? He puts on his cloak. He dives in the water. And so now he gets out in a totally sopped cloak as if he looked better. And when we try to fix things up to come to Jesus, we really just make ourselves look funny, or like Adam and Eve in their fig leaves, right? Yeah, that, that did a lot of good. God must have laughed at those fig leaves, if you think about it. Itchy, sticky fig leaves. Verse 8, the other disciples came in the boat, for they were not far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net full of fish. We use a singular form in the Greek there. It's plural, full of all the fishes. And as soon as they'd come to land, they saw a fire and coals there and fish laid on it. It's a different word for fish, as if like fillets or fishes, pieces of food now, as opposed to living things in the, in the sea. And bread, fish and bread by the sea. Deja vu of what? The feeding of the 5,000. Jesus just sets up all kinds of memories here which tells me God's a romantic, right? This isn't about I'm going to sit you guys down and show you the absolute truth so you can see it clearly. Now, he'd done that with the scriptures on the way to Emmaus. He'd done that in the upper room. He opened up the scriptures and showed them all the things concerning himself. But now he's dealing with memories and heart. He's got to win Peter's heart back. He's got to have Peter's heart be restored because Peter had lost heart. So you've got a, a, re in, uh, a reincarnation of the call by the sea. You've got memories of the feeding of the 5,000, the fish and bread that Jesus multiplied. Where do you get the fish and bread on the fire? You know? Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you've caught. Evidently, he didn't have enough fish there. He said, let's, let's, let's bring those fish. And of course, that means... That means you have to bring the fish, you have to gut the fish. You know, this is messy. And I mentioned even the risen Lord, Jesus, perfected, come out of the grave, glorious, is still a human and he still gets involved in the human mess. He's not so far apart now that we can't get to him. He comes down and gets involved, brings some of the fish. 
Simon Peter went and dragged the net to land. That's just like Peter, you know. Peter's a doer. Okay, let's go get those fish. And he's the big guy, and he drags the fish, the large, or the net to land full of large fish. Remember, John also was a fisherman. John and his brother with their father Zebedee and Andrew and Peter were all partners. So John mentions they were big fish. You know, God didn't give them little six-inch trout. He gave them big fish, 153 of them. I wonder which one of the disciples counted. John knew the number, so maybe he did. As I mentioned last week, I count everything. I would have counted those fish. I would have wanted to know exactly how many fish were there. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, come, eat. The word for eat breakfast there is just a single word, um, like come and breakfast or come and lunch. It refers to the earlier meal of the day, early to midday. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Strange sentence. Guys, you know, guys don't communicate that much. They think all kinds of things, but they have trouble saying it. These guys sitting around, they got a million questions for Jesus, but they seem intimidated, afraid to ask, or they're just kind of sitting on it. But they're just amazed. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. By the sea at the feeding of the 5,000, he took the bread and the fish, he broke it, gave it to them to give to the people. Now Jesus just comes and serves them. Jesus must have loved every moment of this. Because this is probably the last time he had a meal with these guys until the kingdom of God comes. It's kind of like your kids. You know you're not going to see them for a long time, but they come over and you cook them a meal, mom, dad, and it's just your joy to serve your kids, right? There's a lot of romance here. He gave the bread to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now we get to the heart of the story. John tells us all about this because I think he wants us to see the setup. Jesus is filling these guys' minds with memories. Memories that link them to him. Memories of their calling, memories of the feeding by the sea, memories of the big catch, memories of days and nights spent together. He wraps them up in all of these memories because he's going somewhere. When they had eaten, when they had breakfasted, when they'd all had a nice meal, and that's always a nice time to bring up the topic, right? I love getting together with people over a meal. I, I don't know if I like the meal better than the people, but I like getting together over a meal because there's a comfort there, right? You have something to do. Uh, well, you get acquainted and you kind of can make small talk, but then there comes a point if you have a lunch appointment with a specific client or purpose that you've got to get down to business. Right? Okay. Jesus gets down to business. When they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter. Now, there were two Simons, remember? In the disciples, there was Simon Peter and there was Simon the Zealot. So John is being very clear now. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of, your Bible may say Jonah, or your Bible may say John. Actually, same word in the Greek. I'm going to use John. Simon Johnson. Right? That's where the word comes from. Simon, John's son. Now, here he doesn't actually use the word son. It just says Simon of John. But it is, it is one of the ways in the, in the Greek text that you say Simon, son of John. You put the last name in, and the last name is the name of your father. Simon Johnson, 
Do you love me more than these? I find it interesting here that Jesus uses Peter's last name. When your parents repeated your first name or used your last or middle name along with it, you knew something was serious, right? They wanted you to get this. They wanted your attention. I find it interesting. When Jesus first met Peter, go back to chapter 1, verse 42 of John. When Andrew went and found, verse 41, his brother Simon and said, We found the Messiah... Verse 42, he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. Andrew brings Simon, he's not Peter yet. Andrew brings Simon, his brother, to introduce him to Jesus, and Jesus looks up and says, You're Simon Johnson. But I'm going to call you Cephas which is translated Peter, Aramaic and Greek. Interesting uh, first meeting. You know, if the first time you and I met, before I, the person bringing you even had a chance to introduce you, you know, I said, uh, you know, you're Carl Wagner and I'm going to call you Shorty. <laughs> you know, or whatever. It's, it's kind of a a strange thing and yet back in that time names were very important you often didn't name a child for several days till after they were born so you could kind of see their personality start to grow that's how we named our animals Marilyn and I over the years um, we had a canary we named Hugo because we discovered every time we brought him his food we'd go here you go so we just called him Hugo um, and we've had several other, you know, our last dog was Clancy. I don't know why it was Clancy, but Marilyn said, that's a Clancy. So that was Clancy. So, you know, a name will come out of kind of who they are. Something seems to fit. And Jesus says, you're Simon Johnson, and I'm going to call you the rock. That's what it means. I'm going to call you the rock. So from then on, it was Simon the rock, Simon Peter. And all through the Gospels, he becomes, becomes known as Simon the Rock. This name sticks. Well, the rock had just crumbled, right? At the denial, the rock completely pulverized, and there was just nothing left but Simon. The rock was gone. And I find it interesting that Jesus... The, the only other time Jesus calls him Simon Johnson is that other time when Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And Peter said, oh, you are the Messiah. And Jesus said, Simon Johnson, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father did. It's almost as Jesus said, as, as if Jesus gives, calls Peter by his original name that reminds him of who his daddy is and where he came from and what his roots are, and says, you didn't get this from your daddy. You got this from my dad. The knowledge that I am the Messiah. So he calls him Simon Johnson when he first meets him. He calls him Simon Johnson at the, uh, at the confession, you're the Messiah. And that's it. The next time is here. And Jesus repeats this question three times. We'll look at that. There's, there's a lot there. But all three times he says... Simon Johnson, do you love me? He calls him by his original name. Not Simon the Rock, but Simon Johnson. Now, I think there's something to this. What's in a name? What's in a name? You know, when somebody calls me Gary, well, that's what I go by. Or Pastor Gary. Okay, what's, why would you call me Pastor Gary instead of just Gary? Well, it describes something about who I am, right? Um, but if you call me Gary Venden, yes, 
I'm offended, right? And I got to, there's my dad and there's my uncles and there's my grandpa. Man, he was a big man. He was a big Norwegian. I think he, I think he was more muscle than heart. But he was a big Norwegian, you know? Back when he was working in the woods in Washington State, they'd put him on one end of the saw, you know, when they had for the, for the chainsaws to just pull this thing back and forth. Grandpa would just keep going. And they'd have to spell the guy off on the other side with, a, with another guy. Grandpa just kept going. He lifted the front end of a about 1930-something car while they changed the tire. I didn't get all my grandpa's brawn. But... Uh, you know, when you say Gary Venden, I think of stories of being a Venden. I think of the barn in, in uh, Trout Lake Valley, Washington. If you go up out of, out of a White Salmon uh, on the Columbia Gorge, across from Hood River, and you go up into the Trout Lake Valley, there is this valley at about probably 3,000 feet elevation the end, without any mountains in the way, the end just slopes right up into 12,500 foot Mount Adams. It's just an incredible place. And great grandpa Nels built a barn there in 1904-ish that is still standing straight as it could be. Been in that barn. I'm a Vinton. My great grandpa built. He, he, those hand hewn beams, you know, 60, 70 feet tall, he hand chopped those and put them up. I don't know how they did it. But I'm a Vendon, right? When, when, you, when you bring that last name in, it, it brings in a lot of memories. Of, and, and it says something about who I am. Manhood is bestowed by other men. Fathers are the ones who are supposed to bestow manhood on their boys. Show them what it means to be a man. Encourage them that they are a man. Help them grow into being a man. And let them know they have what it takes. You're strong. You know, little boys... My strong daddy, you know? Yeah, take them rock climbing, take them on hikes, do things with them. Show them they're strong, they can do it. Build them. Manhood is bestowed by men and by fathers. And here Jesus seems to take Peter back to their first meeting when he first called him Simon Johnson. Takes him back with all the memories of his daddy. And you know, if you crumble, you have disgraced your family's name. Isn't that right? You know, if I screw up royal and become just a, a, uh, a disappointment in society, I'm glad then my dad's dead. He doesn't have to see it, right? Because it would break his heart. We want to be something for our dads. We want to carry the legacy of our dad. And Peter has completely melted down. And Jesus, I think, here is beginning to rebuild the man. He starts him out right back at the beginning. He gives him memories of that big catch. He gives them memories of the first day they'd met, and he called him Simon Johnson. I'm going to call you the rock. And now he simply says, Simon Johnson... Do you love me more than these? More than what? These is a uh, demonstrative pronoun. These. In order for these to be these, it has to be something right there Jesus can point at. Now these is in the part of speech, it, it can either be masculine or neuter, the way that it is uh, conjugated there. Um, and if you go back in the passage, the disciples would be masculine. He could say, do you love me more than these disciples? The fish are masculine in their gender. Doesn't mean they were all male fish. It's just the gender of the word in the language. The 153 large fish, that's masculine, these. The little word for fish, there was fish on the fire, like fish food, fish for food, that's actually in the neuter gender. So it could be the fish on the fire, the fish in the net, or the guys. I think it's the fish, personally. 
because what Jesus is doing at this point, Peter is at an unexpected crossroads in his life. Is he worthy to be an apostle of Jesus Christ? And the answer is a huge resounding no. He is a complete and utter washout. He changed professions from fisherman to fisher of men. And he complete, at three years, he washed out in his new profession. And I think Peter is actually considering what he's going to do with the rest of his life. I've known pastors that um, messed up. It's usually either women or money. And at age 40, 45, 50, 55 years old, are looking in the mirror at themselves and saying, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Because I can't go back to what I was doing. Because being a pastor is built on your trust in my integrity. I could be the best preacher on planet Earth, but if you don't trust my character and integrity, you're not going to hear a word I have to say. If you don't trust me, I can be a well-skilled leader, but you're not going to follow me. And Peter has blown the trust of Jesus. He's blown the trust of all of his fellow workers. And he's at a point where he's got to decide, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I think what Jesus does with this question is he looks at Peter and says, Peter, where's your heart? Is it with me or is it with fish? Now, what does this tell Peter? In Jesus' eyes, it tells Peter he still has a choice. And I think what happens here is Jesus opens up the door for Peter to come back. He gives Peter that little piece of hope that says, you can still be an apostle. You can still be the rock. You can still be in my business. You're not finished. Everybody else may think you're finished. The disciples may think you're finished. You may think you're finished. But I want to know, where's your heart, Peter? Not what did you do that was wrong. Not how did you screw up. Not how did you blow it. Peter had shown over his life over and over again that his heart was with Jesus, you know. Uh, you're not going to wash my feet. Well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Well, then dump it over my head, right? I want to have a part with you. Peter was always verbosely saying, I will never leave you or forsake you. You are the Messiah. Peter loved Jesus. Have you ever completely melted down in your support of someone you truly love? Of course, we all have. And the question is, do they still love me? But in a way, the question is, do I still believe they love me? Do I still love them? Do, do, do I still have an interest? Uh, when you let somebody down, um, they may even want to forgive you, but they need to find out, do you care? But really asking Peter, do you love me, is I don't think Jesus is really wondering, oh, Peter, do you, do you love me? Je this isn't for Jesus. And he uses the word agape. Agape is the word for unilateral love, the kind of love you love somebody whether they love you back or not. The kind of love that 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8 says is only from God, and the only way we get it is to get it from God. And remember, Jesus has said, Peter, you know I'm the Messiah because the Father told you that. So it's now as if Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you have God's love in your heart for me? Or is it for fish? And Peter comes back, and he says, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. The word know is in the perfect tense, literally something that happened in the past that has continuing ongoing results. You have known all along that I love you. 
It's interesting what Peter says. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know all along that I love you. That was an established fact before I totally let you down. You've known it all along that I love you. And there he uses, Peter comes back with the word love that's phileo, not agape, which means a friendship or a bilateral love. You know that we have had, that I have been responding to your love back to you over time. Jesus kind of says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know, you've all known, known all along that I love you. And Jesus responds, feed my lambs. The word for feed there is the only other place it's really used in the New Testament is that story about the, the swine that were feeding on the hillside <laughs> and the demons went into them and they ran down into the sea. It's, it means grazing. It doesn't mean necessarily literally stuffing food in their mouths, but it means gra graze my lambs. And the word lambs is like for the individual lambs as opposed to the word for a flock of sheep. But what is Jesus saying here? Peter, where's your heart? Me or fish? You mean I still have a choice? Jesus, you've known all along. I love you. Then he says in the imperative tense, command, you graze my lambs. What did Jesus just do? In front of God, all the other disciples, he gave Peter his job back. I love it. He sets up the scene. The catch by the sea, the feeding of the 5,000. He calls him Simon Johnson like the first time he met him. He takes him back to before he was Peter. He takes him back to when he was just a fisherman. And he sets it all up once again like he did by the sea. Two boatloads of fish. Now follow me and leave them. Do you love me more than fish? Follow me. And now he says, Simon Johnson, do you love me more than fish? You've known all along, Jesus, that I love you. And he says, here's your job back. Jesus is in the process of rebuilding a broken man. And that's what Jesus is all about. He rebuilds broken people. I don't know where you've been broken. <laughs> but Jesus would like to feed you breakfast bring back some precious memories and tell you you're still on his team. Let's pray. Jesus, you are amazing how you go after our hearts. Not in a didactic way, not in an analytical way. Yes, you do take the scriptures and open them to us so we can understand. But then you use memories and surroundings and circumstances and food and names and you create a circumstance a setting to romance us and then you go for our hearts you want to heal our hearts where they've been broken you want to give us our place back on your team. Jesus, I don't know who here today has gone through what necessarily, but we've all melted, crashed in numbers of ways. Would you speak to each of our hearts today and let us know we still have a choice to serve you, to be on your team, or to go back to whatever else we might try to fall back on. Jesus, I'd like to say that you know, you've known all along that we love you. And we want to hear your command that gives us our job back. We're still on your team. You're in the business of rebuilding broken people, and we bring our hearts to you and ask you to heal and rebuild today. In Jesus' name, amen.